Hey, we've been talking about the living hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the very first couple of verses, it says Jesus is our living hope. And we've been developing the whole book around that idea of being the living hope. And today, I want to talk about when the battle is at your door. You see, the Bible tells us your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's just waiting to pounce on you. Did you know that? Now, we're in a spiritual war. Now, most of the time we think of a spiritual war, we, we, you know, we, we think of some great huge battle that is going on, you know, because of the movies, uh, dark evil beings and angels, and they're fighting and colliding. We kind of dismiss spiritual warfare to the unseen world that we don't see and we just say it's out there. I came across a, a blog this last week by David Jeremiah. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but he's a, a Bible preacher, teacher on the radio and also television. But um, on his blog, he, says, uh, he said something like this. You may be in spiritual warfare if you're fatigued. Believe me, I'm a little fatigued today. But it wasn't because of a spiritual warfare going on in my life. It's because uh, they wore me out yesterday. <laughs> you know? Um, but if you're, if you're fatigued and, and you haven't overdone it, and you're just drained. It says, the Bible says this, They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up like wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. If you're drained in your spiritual life and you know it, you're fatigued, it's probably because there is a spiritual war going on and you've got a battle somewhere and you need to get back on track. He also listed anxiety. If you have anxiety and worry and you're fretting, and it's like out of the norm for where you'd normally be in life, and you really can't put your finger on it. Why am I so anxious? He said, it could be a spiritual war. You've got a battle going on in your life. The Bible says, an anxious heart weighs a man down. Just weighs you down. Maybe it's your being tempted that one is usually pretty obvious because most of us know what it is that tempts us. We know what buttons to push. You can push that coffee button on me all day and I am not tempted. But now if you put an ice cold diet soda up there on a hot summer day, I am greatly tempted. Tempted. We, most of us know those temptations, but if we're not dealing with our temptations accurately and, and faithfully for the Lord, you're probably in a spiritual battle. You're in a spiritual battle. Because the Bible says, when you are tempted. It doesn't say if. It says when. You are going to be tempted, okay? There's going to be spiritual war. Perhaps you're fearful. That's out of the norm of fear. Fear is a good thing. We should be afraid of fires when it gets caught in the curtains in the house. But as long as it stays in the fireplace, I'm not afraid of it. All right? But if I have fear because there's fire in the fireplace, you see, that's extraordinary. Out of the ordinary fear. It may be that there's something bigger behind that. If I have fear in my life, I'm just fearful and I can't explain why. Could be that you have a spiritual war going on. Maybe you're depressed. You see, the Apostle Paul said, I'm hard-pressed, but I am not in despair. My circumstances aren't going my way, and I'm feeling really down. Normally, I'm able to handle it, but for some reason right now, I am just totally, I, I, I am so sad and down, I'm depressed, and I just can't explain why. It could be that there's something spiritually going on and not the physical realm at all. Maybe you're angry. <laughs> you're not normally angry when they cut you off on the road, but today you got a little road rage. 
You just want to hit the accelerator and give him a little tap on the behind. <laughs> Yeah, you know that'll do damage to your car, so you decide you're going to whip around, pull in front of him, put on your brakes, and let him see what it's like. <laughs> he said, wait a minute, that's not me. What's, what's going on here? Why am I angry? It could be there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's manifesting itself in different ways. Maybe it's prayerlessness. I think a lot of us have this battle. We just don't pray as we ought to pray. We kind of really just pray as a last-ditch effort. When I've exhausted everything that I can do, and then I don't pray. Then I'm going to finally pray. Often we, we experience these other things, anxiety, fear, anger, depression, because I'm not praying. And because I'm not praying, I just, I just don't feel like praying. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says that prayer is a struggle. Jesus said, watch and pray. The disciples fell asleep instead. Watch and pray. If you've got that prayerless sense, you might be in a spiritual war uh, and that's why you're at that point. What I'm trying to say is, there is a battle at all of our doors, and our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion seeking to pounce on that particular area of our life to defeat us. So, the fact is, you are in a war once you become a Christian. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. I'm in a war, and I, I don't take up uh, you know, a sword. I, I don't take up a, a knife. I don't take up a bow or arrow. And I don't take up a gun. Because it's a spiritual war. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. I, pray, I, I, I use the Word of God, and I pray. I attend church. I serve people. Uh, I, I, there's all these things that I do. They're not the things that in the world does when they fight a war. But when I do these things, I am battling off all those things I just listed. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to de demolish strongholds. A stronghold is like the enemy gets a beachhead on my territory. He sets up in my heart some anxiety and worry and care for my kids or whatever the situation may be, or my job or income, or, or I'm afraid. I have an overwhelming amount of fear, and he's got this speech, and it's controlling me. But this verse says, our spiritual armament has power to destroy that beachhead so that it no longer controls me, I control it. My God is powerful, more powerful than anything here on this planet. He says, we demolish arguments. Every argument, oh, but you just don't understand what it is like for me. No, maybe I don't. Especially if it's a woman. I'm not a woman. I don't understand what it's like to be. He says, here, but, the, but when you get into the Word and you're praying, it demolishes all those arguments of why you can't do what you need to do. It demolishes them. Every pretense, all this pretending that, that you, can't, you can't change, you can't be different. He says, every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Where do we find the knowledge of God? In the Bible. When the Bible tells me, all right, uh, to not be anxious, and I'm being anxious, and then I say, but I can't change, and then I'm denying what the Bible says. Yeah, I can. When I depend upon the Word and trust God, I can not be anxious. Isn't that amazing? He says, in fact, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I just... What do you do when the battle's at the door and the enemy's there? You send Jesus to answer the door. 
You go to the Lord and you say, Lord, this is my problem. This is my battle. I can't face it alone. You've got to come with me and you've got to deal with it in my life. That's what he said. The fact is, you are in a war every day someplace along the way. You have a spiritual battle to fight. And the first thing you've got to do is arm yourself. You've got to arm yourself. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, he says, arm yourself. Listen, if Christ suffered temptation and, and he had all these attacks, who do you think you are that you don't need armament? Well, the Apostle Paul said to put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand in the day of battle because he's going to send fiery darts at you. You need a shield of faith. He's going to make you doubt your salvation. You need to put the helmet of salvation on. And Paul tells us all these wonderful truths. And here he just simply puts it this way. Arm yourself. He says he's given you a sword. It's the Word of God. He says, oh, not, not a physical sword. It's the Bible. You get into the Word and you allow the Word to get into you. You arm yourself. That's why we memorize these verses. When I'm in a situation, you know, I had a situation where, man, anger was just getting the best of me. And I memorized the verse. It says, uh, the, the verse said, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And I thought, I tell myself that. What? The fool gives full vent to his anger, but the wise man keeps himself under control. Boy, as soon as I quote that verse in that angry situation, that anger just subsided. Why? I've armed myself. I, I've got armor. He says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his, in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. The same mind of Christ. The only way I'm going to have the mind of Christ and the attitude that I need to have is i got to get into the Word. i got to get into prayer more and more. All the more when I feel like there's a battle outside my door. He says, because he who has suffered in this body is done with sin. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I was identified with Jesus in the union. So there's a real sense in which I have suffered in Christ, and so I don't have to be the same old person I used to be. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. I'm done in Christ. He's paid it all in full. So why would I allow myself to live in that lifestyle? I can live a different life because I'm already in Christ. He says, have the attitude that you are the victor in Jesus Christ. You are not the victim. You are not the victim. Secondly, he says, as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil. Why? I'm identified with Christ. I've already won this battle in Christ. Positionally, I'm seated in heavenly places, but here on earth, i got to make my life match my position in Christ. He says, my earthly life, he says, there's evil here and evil desires, but rather I'm going to live for the will of God. I'm going to match what I am seated in heaven. I, I am a child of God. Arm yourself with the mind of Christ, with the will of God. And he says then, arm yourself against the cultural norms. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. One of the telltale signs of somebody becoming a genuine Christian is their life is changed from the inside out. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. When a person says they accepted Christ and they prayed a prayer or they made a, you know, a decision to follow Jesus, but then they continue to live, as it says here, what the pagans choose to do, they live in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and all those detestable idols that they have in their lives. They, there's no change from the inside out. How can they claim to really have found Jesus? When I found Jesus as an eight-year-old boy, I was convicted terribly of the things that were wrong when I did them. And I meandered away from the Lord, and every time I did something wrong, 
It was just brutal inside. And what did I do? I'd just further get away from God, further get away from God, but God didn't get further away from me. The Bible tells us He chastens those that He loved, and He really spanked me good. <laughs> he didn't kill me, but He spanked me for my good that I get back on the right track. Now, if you don't have that part going on in your life, a fatherly love trying to correct you and discipline you, and you say, well, yeah, you know, well, you, you've made a, a confession, but it's never taken in your heart, then you need, to, you need to have a soul searching. Say, Lord, I need Jesus to be my Savior and change me from the inside out. I'm committing my heart and my life to you because He changes your life. He changes your life. Second thing is you have to align yourself for battle. No, no. When I was a kid, I used to say to somebody, you want to fight? Oh, yeah? You want to fight? And they'd say, yeah, because they were not not really my friend. I'd say, okay. Cross that line. Well, the person would cross that line. I'd say, okay, now you're on my side. What side are you on? You've got to align yourself for battle. Watch what he says. Do not align yourself with the world. Hey, you want to have spiritual victory? You can't cross over to the world side and expect to have victory in your life. How foolish. Here, here you're on God's side and he's attacking you, but you say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to go over. I'm, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to carouse a little while. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to... And you expect God to bless your life? You're on the enemy side. You got to stay on God's side. He says, they think it is strange that you do not plunge in with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you all the more because you're living righteously for God. Wow. You align yourself and by aligning yourself with Jesus, you're automatically going to have those who are going to think you're really weird and strange. And they're going to think you're the problem. And they're going to attack you because they think you're the problem. And the truth is, they don't know Christ. <laughs> they are the problem. Hmm. He goes on and he says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They're going to give an account, but guess what? We're going to give an account too. They're going to give an account at the great white throne judgment of God at the end of time, before God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and they are going to be dismissed to the lake of fire which burns forever and ever. But we're going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ, which is so totally different. Because Jesus has taken all of our judgment. We're not going to go to a lake of fire. But we will either receive a reward or lose a reward for what we have done. But we all are going to give an account. In Romans 15 it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, To give an account for what we have done in our bodies, whether good or bad. I'm going to give an account. I'm going to give an account of what I do. You align yourself with God and you align yourself with the gospel. For this reason, the gospel was preached. You see, the gospel is what is life transforming. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So we share the gospel with the people so that the people on the other side who are, are enslaved by Satan might hear the good news, accept Jesus, and join our side. They might cross and be on our side. The battle goes on. Before they were on this side fighting against Christ and us, and now they accept Christ. Now they're in a battle, and they're fighting against the old world the devil, and their old nature. And he it says it's the gospel. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, people, Christians who have died. He said so that they might be judged according to men regarding their body. That's what they did over here. They judged their bodies. But he says over here, they live according to God regarding the Spirit. The good news is anybody on this side, and we're all on this side at one point, for all have sinned, 
but anybody who accepts the gospel becomes on this side. And that side now, where we used to feel comfortable, we don't feel comfortable there anymore. Because I'm over here, they don't like that I'm over here, and they try to pull us back over there. And he's saying, but the good news, anyone who believes will come over to this side, and God will work in their hearts and lives too. Next thing we have to do is alert yourself for the battle. You have to have alert. When I grew up, half the neighbors didn't even lock their house. Remember those days? Some of you remember those days. You didn't, even, you didn't lock your car. A lot of you just kept the key in it, and you went in the store, came back out, and the car was still sitting there. <laughs> now we put alarms on everything. We alarm our, our houses, you know, we make sure we take our keys. People are now putting trackers on their cars so when they get taken, they can track and tell the police exactly where it's at. Oh my goodness, these are all alerts. You need to alert yourself for a battle. You need to be on alert. Don't be sleeping. Don't be caught off guard. He says, here's the deal. The end of all things is near. Alert yourself that, hey, the end is coming. It's not always going to go on as it is. The end of all things is near. I read my Bible, and then I read the news, or I watch it. And I, whoa, the more I read my Bible, the more, the more I say, the end is near. The end is near. Prophetically, there's wars and rumors of wars. There's natural disasters in, in all kinds of places. There's people who are so anti-Christ. I'm living in the last days. He says, the end is near. Therefore, he says, be of a clear mind, clear conscience. So I, I, I got the, the mannequin up there, and you've got a hollow head. You can see right through. <laughs> it's clear. I didn't know how else to illustrate this. I'm not telling you to check out your mind, you know, get rid of your... No, a clear conscience. You see, you can have a corrupt conscience. You can have a seared conscience. The Bible has all kinds of consciences. And, and that conscience is that part of you that judges what you do or what you, uh, what you think. Who you are, it's that part, that part of you that judges what you've done. And, and what he's saying is, therefore have a clear mind. Judge yourself. Are you doing the will of God? Or are you doing the will of man? What, what's going on here? How? Have a clear conscience because the time is short. And he says, and have self-control. Don't you wish there was an on and off switch? <laughs> and you could just turn it on and turn it off. Well, the Bible very much says you do. You are in control of all of your emotions, all of your emotions. I have watched an angry person yelling and screaming at their child and then turn to me and say, oh, <laughs> They don't yell and scream at me. You, you are always in control. It's always interesting. A person is yelling and screaming and fight is going on in the house and the phone rings and they pick it up and they go, hello. Why? They're in control. You're in control. All of your emotions, you're in control of them. He's saying you need to have self-control. Self-control in all your circumstances so that you can pray. When you're out of control, you don't even know how to pray. So that you can pray. We're prayerless because we think we are in control. When I finally get to the end of my rope, what do I do? I pray. Why? Because I think I'm in control all the time before that. But when I finally get to the point where I don't think I'm any longer in control, then I pray. You need him to help you have that self-control. Listen, the next thing is we need to activate yourself for battle. Activate. It's okay to have all these things in your head, but at some point you've got to put them into practice. If you don't put them into practice, you're just book smart. You're not street smart. You've got, you got to... Some, at some point, when the battle's at the door, you've got to open the door and you've got, you've got to battle. And what you battle with is love. He says, you activate love. Now, above all, 
Love each other deeply. Did you see that? It's just piled on. Love one another. It goes back and forth. It's reciprocal. But he says deeply. Deeply. Here's why. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. It doesn't cover up. It covers over. It's like an atonement covering over. He says here, love Love cares for people and it wants their very best not just to uncover and expose, and, but love wants their very best. It covers up their mistakes. It gives the benefit of the doubt and says, here, listen, you need to live for Jesus correctly. You activate yourself with, for battle with love. Love is going to win more people to Christ than all the judgment in the world. We have to love people into to coming into a relationship with Jesus. Then he says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I didn't know how to illustrate this hospitality thing other than, you know, hospitality is just entertaining strangers, asking people to come over, be in your house. And then I found this picture of this little kid in a cardboard house. I put the open house sign there say, come on in. Come on in. You know, the early church didn't meet in buildings like this other than the temple. You know where they met? House to house. Look it up. Book of Acts. House to house. House to house. We need to be regularly inviting people over. Over. Even our neighbors. Here he's specifically saying one another, part of the, the body of Christ. Inviting someone to my house and then them inviting me back without keeping score. <laughs> but we invite. We're, we're hospitable. We have them come over. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. You know where the grumbling comes? I've had them over three times. They've never had me over. <laughs> so what? You're following what Christ wants you to do. You're not the inspector to see what they're supposed to be doing. It is your responsibility to be hospitable. You say, my house is so small. Rent a hall. I don't care. I don't care. How are we going to be hospitable? We're going to invite people over. We're going to take them out. My younger brother, I love my younger brother. He's with the Lord now. Every Sunday, every single Sunday, he invited somebody, hopefully a new person, from church out to dinner or to his house. Boom. He started a small group 20 years ago, longer than that now, probably 30 years ago. My brother has died, but his small group is still going on at his house. His wife now leads it. That's hospitality. I mean, he says, if you, want, if you want to be strong in your faith, you surround yourself with Christians, you're hospitable, and they're hospitable to you, you are strengthened in numbers. And you get this small squad, a small group, that is people you're accountable to, and he says, you're activating yourself to actually do battle spiritually. You are. You are. And then he says, with your gifts. You see, God has given everybody a gift. You've got something, because you are a part of the body of Christ. You are a gift to the church, everyone. Everybody has a gift here. He says, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. That's why I thought the event yesterday was such a great success. We reached out to community people, people we don't know, some of them, I still don't know their names. They all signed in in order to get their food ticket. All right. But we, we, we used, everybody had a different talent and gift here. And we were all working together 
to serve. This is, each one of you use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. That was one of the forms. Just helping and reaching out to people we don't even know. Wow. Then he says, and if anyone speaks, he should be. He should do it as one speaking the very word of God. See, that's why we do all the rest. Nobody ever got saved by us serving. They only get saved by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But serving gives us the right to speak into their lives the word of God so that they will listen to what we say. In fact, oftentimes they ask us for the reason of hope that lies within us. We talked about that last week. And then we are to be ready and prepared to share with them the very words of God. Isn't that great? Now we're doing battle. We're doing battle. The final one, it says, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that all things may be praised uh, through Jesus. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. He made this a prayer. <laughs> he said, oh, that you would serve, that you would serve, that you would serve. You may be in a spiritual war right now. If you're fatigued, you're anxious, you're tempted, you're fearful, depressed, angry, prayerless, a lot of other things too. Behind all of that, there is a battle that could be going on. Could be going on. And when the battle is at your door, what do you do? Don't run. Stand your ground. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Arm yourself for the battle. Align yourself for battle. Alert yourself for battle. Activate yourself for battle. Therefore, put on the full armor of God that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. In the Daily Bread, it had this little poem. I think I've quoted it here before. I had a battle fierce today within my place of prayer. I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He said, you can't really pray. You lost out long ago. You may say words while on your knees, but you can't pray, you know. So then I pulled my helmet down, way down upon my ears. I found it helped to still his voice and help delay my fears. I checked my other armor o'er. My feet in peace were shod. My loins with truth were girt about. My sword, the word of God. My righteous breastplate still was on. My heart's love to protect. My shield of faith was all intact. His fiery darts bounced back. So then I prayed in Jesus' name and I pled the precious blood while Satan sneaked away in shame. I met and talked with God. You've got to arm yourself. You've got to arm yourself so that you are the victor. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know what battle is outside the door of each one here. You do. I do know the solution is found in Jesus. So when the devil knocks on our door, may each one of us go to the door and answer it with Jesus at our side. Greater is he that is with us, the one in us, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world. Lord, may we arm ourselves, align ourselves, and activate ourselves to do battle for Jesus, the captain of our salvation. If someone's struggling right now, may they just put a resolve in their heart and say, today, I'm going to do battle with you, Jesus. If there's someone here who has been on the other side, they say, you know what, I've aligned myself in the wrong place. I'm going to make Jesus my Savior, my Lord, the captain of my salvation. I'm going to ask him to save me right now. And I'm going to get on the right side. I know that they just pray and say, Lord, save me. Truly save me, Lord, that you will. We pray this, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.